Hello everybody, this is a very important video. This is the Common Core Algebra 2 Common Regions questions you must be able to do. I cannot predict the entire exam, but I can pretty much predict 80 to 85 percent of the exam, and 80 to 85 percent of the exam will be the questions we are about to go over. So let's get right to it, starting with our strategies. This is a factoring problem. I call this advanced grouping. However, if I see variables in the problem and variables in the answers, I use what I call multiple choice strategy with variables. So we're going to pull up our calculator. We're going to start by storing a value for x. I always use 10 for x and 15 for y. So I'm going to do 10 store as x, 15 store as y. This assigns values to those variables, which will make this strategy work. Instead of k, I'm going to type x, x to the fourth, minus 4x to the second, plus 8x to the third, minus 32x, plus 12x squared, minus 48. I got 18,432. So now I'm going to type in each choice and I'm going to see which one matches up. So choice 1, x minus 2, x minus 2, x plus 3, x plus 4, 11,648. That's not the same, so that can't be the answer. Now for choice two, instead of retyping the whole thing, I can just copy and paste. Um, and all I'm doing is changing the three to a six and the four to a two. 12, 288. That does not match up to 18, 432. Try choice three, copy and paste again. I'm gonna copy and paste the first one since that was more similar. It's just k plus 2 instead of k minus 2. So I'm going to tab back and change that one up. 17, 472. Now don't just say, oh, well, since the th those three can't be it, then the fourth one can't. Um, you could always make a mistake. Maybe you didn't read carefully. So you always want to go through all four choices x plus 2, x minus 2, x plus 6, x plus 2. 18, 4, 32. It matches. That's the answer. This strategy will work on factoring, synthetic division, long division, Fractional exponents, radicals, negative exponents, reducing rational expressions, a lot of different types of questions uh, that are asked on the Algebra 2 regions and the Algebra 1 regions. It's a really useful strategy to utilize. We, If you want to see how this problem has gone over in full, stay tuned. I'm going to do an actual factor review later on. Now, another strategy, multiple choice equations. I'm going to store each potential answer. I'm going to type in the left-hand side. I'm going to type in the right-hand side. I'm going to see what matches up. Essentially, I'm just substituting each one in, but um, using the storing function just makes it a little bit easier. So I'm going to start by checking 3 over 2. So I'm going to do alpha y equals enter. 3 over 2 store is x. I'm going to type in the left-hand side. 3x plus 25 over x plus 7 minus 5. Three over x. Does the left hand side equal the right hand side? No. So therefore three over two can't be an answer. So choice one can't be the answer. Let's try seven over two. Alpha y equals enter, 7 over 2, store is x. I can just copy and paste the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And keep in mind that 
this video is a little bit of everything. I do have individual videos for every single lesson that I'm that's going to be included on here. So you can check out Schlansky.com or my YouTube channel, Math Schlansky, in order to get the full videos for each of these. Does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side? No. So 7 over 2 can't be an answer. Next, I'm going to try negative 3 over 2. Negative alpha y equals... Enter. 3 over 2. Store as x. Type in the left-hand side. Type in the right-hand side. Do those equal out? No. So that can't be the answer. So again, I'm hoping this choice 4 works, or else I'm going to have to go through everything again. Negative 7 over 2. Store as x. Type in the left-hand side. Type in the right hand side. Yes, they match up, so negative 7 over 2 works. Now what this what choice 4 is saying is that negative 7 over 2 works and that negative 3 works. So, I mean, I'm pretty confident the answer is choice 4 at this point, but I'm going to verify that. I'm going to store negative 3. Type in the left hand side, type in the right hand side, it equals out. That works. So, if it's an equation that's multiple choice, take each potential answer, substitute it in. You can do that with storing. The left-hand side equals the right-hand side, then it's a solution. Solve graphically. So, if it's an equation and it is not multiple choice, we are going to talk later in this video about how to do all the algebra necessary in this course. But, to solve graphically, we have a strategy, and that's y1, y2, intersect and that's the work you need to show if you show this work then you can get up to half of the points if it says algebraically and if it doesn't say algebraically you can get the full points this is you showing your work for doing this procedure um, but understand if it does say algebraically you will not get full credit for this procedure but if you're someone who can't do algebra now you can scrape together some points type the left hand side into y1 radical x squared plus x minus 1 plus 11x 7x plus 3 I always start with zoom 6 we may need to adjust our window but we'll deal with that later on if we need to it looks like I see the intersection up there so now I go second trace option 5 I'm gonna move I'm gonna find my cursor I think I went past it already. And there it is. I want to get it close to the intersection point. Enter, enter, enter. The solution is always, 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 always the x coordinate. x coordinate, x coordinate. Whenever you do y1, y2 intersect, the solution is always your x coordinate. x equals 0.6 repeated. That would be your solution. And again, it wouldn't say solve graphically. This is me uh, using this question to practice the strategy. It would not say solve graphically. Most likely for a question like this, it would say solve algebraically. What we just did would earn us half of the points, and we will solve this later on algebraically. But make sure that you are writing down your y1, y2 intersect. That's how you will get, you, that's how you're showing your work where you can rack up the points. You could use this strategy if it's multiple choice as well. I just find it easier to do the storing, but if you're comfortable with Y1, Y2 intersect, you could use that if it's multiple choice as well. This is more of multiple choice strategy with variables. Again, this whole video is not going to be strategies, it's just they're all at the beginning. Which factorizations are correct? Well, if I want to know if this is equal to this, I'm going to type this in, I'm going to type this in, I'm going to see if it equals out. Instead of A and B, I'm going to use X and Y because I stored values for X and Y. So, the first one x to the third plus 27y to the third. To type in y, it's alpha 1. I'm going to type in the right hand side x plus 3y 
x squared minus 3xy plus 9y squared. Does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side? Yes, they're both 12,167.2963, so that one works. Now I'm going to try choice two. The left-hand side, x cubed minus 6x squared. Miss the minus there. It is definitely harder to type on my little screen than on your actual calculator. So if I can do it, I think you can handle it. Minus 30x plus 40. That's my left hand side. Hope I didn't type anything in wrong. My right hand side, x minus 2 x minus 4. I feel like my voice is a little too monotone, but I'm in a library and I don't know. I don't want to start screaming and people think I'm crazy sitting here like staring at a computer and screaming to it. Uh, yes, those match up. So choice 2 works as well. Now we got to try choice 3. 1 minus x to the power of 4. 1 plus x squared. 1 minus x squared. Does the left hand side equal the right hand side? No. 1 and 2 only. This is a hard question to do without multiple choice strategy. I mean, you have to know how to do sum of two cubes. You need to know how to do advanced factoring. Um, and again, we will go over all that, but uh, if you're, especially if you're not a strong student, this is a very easy way to get a hard question correct. All right, real math, finally. To find, oops, I don't want a circle. Why would I want a circle? Come on, circle, get out of there. All right, it's asking for the quotient. Well, quotient means to divide. There are two methods for division. There's synthetic division and there's long division. Again, uh, I can't predict the exact exam, but it's unlikely you're gonna have to do long division. I can only think of one question ever where you had to do long division as an open response question, because if it's multiple choice, we can use our multiple choice strategy. So we're just gonna focus on synthetic division. List the coefficients, three, seven, negative 20. You wanna check for missing terms. There is no missing terms here, uh, but you always wanna check for that. Whatever you're dividing by, the opposite of that goes outside. First number comes down, then I multiply, add. I multiply the bottom and the outside, add. Multiply bottom and the outside, add. These are the coefficients of my answer. I take the original highest exponent and I decrease it by one. So that's gonna be three x to the first, or just three x. Then it's my constant term, and then it's my remainder and my remainder goes over my divisor. Again, this is me reviewing. If you want a full lesson on this, I should have videos for everything on Schlansky.com as well as on my YouTube channel, Math Schlansky. Is x plus two a factor? To determine if something's a factor, I need to find the remainder. To find the remainder, I do remainder theorem. I could do synthetic division, but it's easier to just do remainder theorem. Remainder theorem is substituting the opposite of what I'm dividing by in for x. So I'm replacing all the x's with negative twos. Now I can do this with storing in the calculator. Um, you don't have to do it with storing, but I like to do it with storing. But as far as showing the work goes, you need to show what you're actually doing. x to the third minus 3x to the second minus 8x plus 4. I got a remainder of 0. So if the remainder is 0, then yes, it's a factor. If the remainder is anything else, then it's not. Is x plus 2 a factor? Yes, because the remainder is 0. Don't say it. Try and steal from it in your explanations. Yes, because the remainder is zero. Every single reason they ask this. On the grid below, sketch a cubic polynomial whose factors are. So you need to link in your brain factors and zeros. If you know the factors, you know the zeros. If you know the zeros, you know the factors. 
to go back and forth between factors and zeros, I essentially switch the sign, just like I did in synthetic division, just like I did in remainder theorem. So if x minus 1 is a factor, then 1 is a 0. If x minus 3 is a factor, then 3 is a 0. If x plus 2 is a factor, then negative 2 is a 0. And the zeros are where the graph crosses the x-axis. So this has zeros of 1, 3, negative 2. Get in the habit of labeling them. If there is no grid, you would need to label them. And now we're just going to grow, sketch a polynomial function that passes through them. That's those bumpy, curvy things. It doesn't specify if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, it opens up. So I'll do a positive one. You should draw arrows. And that's it. I think it's really one of the easiest, you know, regions question you can get. Just a matter of knowing how to do it and knowing when to switch the sign and when not to. The zeros hit the x-axis. If it says the zeros are 1, 3, and negative 2, then you put the points at 1, 3, and negative 2. If it tells you the factors, you are switching the sign to get the zeros. So, two ways to do this. I see variables in the problem. I see variables in the answers. So, again, I'm going to use my multiple choice strategy. You thought I was done with it. I'm not. X plus I squared minus X minus I squared. Now I'm going to type in each choice. So that's negative 8I. Now, I changed my stored value before uh, when I did the remainder theorem, but it's not going to really affect much. Um, as long as it's not zero, it should be fine. But you know what? Let's just go back to 10. Sometimes when it's negative, it could affect things in the exponent lesson. So let's just always use 10 for x. But it really wouldn't have affected this particular problem. So let's go with 40i. Depending on what you store for x, you'll get a different value, but all that matters is that the answer will match up. Well, it can't be choice 1 or choice 2, because if I type in each of those, I'm just going to get 0 and negative 2. That's not 40i. Negative 2 plus 4xi. Negative 2 plus 40i. That does not match up. And hopefully 4xi will. And it does. 40i. Now, if you're saying, Shlansky, come on already, like, stop with the strategies. I want to know how to do the math. Well, yes, I will go over how to do this type of question um, algebraically now, but I'm not going to go over this particular one because this is nasty. This is a nasty, uh, this is some nasty algebra. I'm not going to do it because why would I do it when I can do a multiple choice strategy? And I usually don't make it as hard when it's open response. It's usually something more like this. So, I treat i just like any other variable. I distribute to get rid of the parentheses. I get 2x i squared minus 8x i cubed. Now, what you need to know for this lesson, the only thing that makes this different than seventh grade algebra, i squared is equivalent to negative 1, and i cubed is equivalent to negative i. So, I'm going to replace the i squared with negative 1. I'm going to replace the i cubed with negative i. I worked it back through. 2x times negative 1 is negative 2x. Negative 8x times negative i is positive 8xi. That's your answer. When it says a plus bi form, that just means there's going to be an i in the answer. And a plus bi form means is that the i comes at the end and the not i term comes first. Which equation represents the equation of the parabola? You know, I'm thinking about changing the formula I give for this. I'm recording this video now. Should I just go for it now? Yeah, I think I should just go for it now. So I'm going to do it both ways. I'm going to do it the way that uh, I'm going to change it to, because the regents is always changing. And they used to give the T answers in all these different forms. And lately, it's really usually having Y by itself. Um, I feel like my students are having a hard time manipulating stuff. So I'm just going to go right to this, the new one first. And in fact, in my head last night, because this is apparently what I do, I like, I'm updating the song for this. But I can't remember how it goes right now. So there's this. And there's 
how I have been doing it, x minus v squared over 4p equals y minus t. I'm going to do it both ways. Um, for the present and for the future. Because I don't want to re-record this video for just one question because this is going to take me hours. Yes, I did say hours. Uh, focus is negative 3, 3. Directrix is y equals 7. You need to know that the vertex is always in between the other two. So I count 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's got to be 2 from each of them. That's my vertex. That is negative 3, comma 5. I want to sketch my parabola. The parabola cannot hit the directrix. The parabola is the set of points that are equidistant between the point, the focus, and the line, the directrix. Now, let's do it the new way first. I'm going to still list my variables. V equals T equals P equals. VT is the vertex. Most teachers call it like H and K, but what, what's H and K? VT, vertex. Not the focus, it's VT, the vertex. P is the distance from the vertex to the focus. If I'm going down 2, then P is negative 2. Basically, if the parabola opens up, it's positive. If it opens down, it's negative. Now, I substitute the values in. Now, this plus or minus, well, I'm kind of in between the two ways. So, if, if it opens down, it's going to be minus. If it opens up, it's going to be plus. So, since it opens down, I'm just going to put the negative in front. 1 over 4p. x minus v means change the sign of the x coordinate. Plus t means keep the sign of the y coordinate. The only thing I can do is 4 times 2 is 8. That's your answer. That's your answer. Now, something else you can do once you get your sketch, because I see like a lot of students were having trouble. They, they're able to get the sketch, but they're not able to get to the equation because, you know, they can't remember anything. Once you have the sketch, you can type in each one and look at it and see which one matches up. So for choice three, I can type in negative alpha y equals enter, one eighth, x plus three, whoops, squared plus five, zoom six, and I want to pay close attention to the vertex. Is the vertex in the right quadrant? Yes, that's my answer. So yeah, moving forward, I think I'm going to go with this because um, that's what I choose to do. That's what I think will be best. Now, this is going the opposite direction. If they give you the equation, you have to pull the vertex from the equation. So x minus 2. I'm changing the sign of the x-coordinate. I'm not changing the sign of the y-coordinate. If they give me the equation, let me just, it's hard to see. If they give me the equation, I have to pull the vertex by negating the x-coordinate, not negating what's at the end for the y-coordinate. Once I have that, I plot that. Now, if there's no graph paper attached to this question, then use the graph paper attached to the back of the exam. The directrix is y equals negative 1. I know that the vertex has to be in between the other two, so 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Is my vertex in between the other two? Yes. The coordinates of the focus are 2, comma 5. Now, even if it didn't give me the directrix, since this is 12, I know that P would have to be 12 divided by 4, which is 3. So I could have just counted up three since it's positive. That's it. You will see one of these on your exam. Oh, yeah, this question. This is the question that everybody got wrong. No matter how many times we say, when we do y1, y2 intersect, it's always the x-coordinate. So to find the solution of two equations being set equal to each other, y1, y2 intersect. And the solution is always, 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 always the x-coordinate. So it cannot be choices three or four. The solution is always, always, always the x-coordinate for when these two equations are equal. So make sure you're only staying the x-coordinate. Expect to have to adjust your window. 
expect to have to adjust it. You're not definitely going to have to adjust it, but expect to have to. You need to know how to type all this stuff in. Absolute value bars are in a few places. Alpha window one is where that's my go-to. It's also in math num. And listen, worst comes to worst, go to catalog. 0 0.03 x to the power of 3 minus x plus 1. Start with zoom 6. I see two intersections right now, so I'm going to find those. Second trace, option 5, move the cursor, enter, enter, enter. I'm only looking at the x coordinate. I see negative 0.99. That's not there. So now I'm going to find the next one. Second trace, option 5. Enter, enter, enter. X equals 0 0.50. That's not there. So there's got to be another intersection. And, and yes, the curve always catches the line. So I want to see more of the top right. So I go to window. I'm going to adjust my X max to 20. I'm going to adjust my, that's my right. My Y max is my top. I always at least double things when I adjust the window. All right, my X looks good, but my Y looks like I need to see more of it, so I'm going to double my Y max again. Let's see what that looks like. Looks good. I see my intersection point. Second trace, option five. And by the way, if you see nothing and you really can't find anything, zoom zero, zoom fit would be your go-to. Enter, enter, enter. 11.29 is the third intersection. Do I see that option there? Yes. I can't tell you how many students pick choice three because choice three was a point of intersection. No, it's not the X, Y coordinate for Y1, Y2 intersect. It is always the X coordinate unless it specifically says point of intersection or the Y coordinate of the point of intersection. Once it asks for the point of intersection, um, you're just seeing the X coordinate. Which quadratic has the largest maximum? Well, find the maximum of each and tell me which one is the largest. The graph is probably the easiest. The maximum value is the Y coordinate of the vertex. I hope I didn't confuse you when I just said X coordinate, X coordinate. Now I'm saying Y coordinate. Maximum and minimum values are Y values. One, two, three, four and a half is the maximum value of the graph. For the table, well, the highest value I see in the table is nine. It's going to probably be more like nine and a half since uh, this appears to be a parabola and the vertex is in the middle and it's not there. It's probably more like nine and a half. But if you wrote nine, it's really not going to affect the outcome of this problem. For the equations, type them in and then either look at the table or look at the graph. Your choice. I'm going to look at the graph. I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to be precise, even though we really don't need to be precise for this particular question, but I'll be precise. I always start with zoom six. I adjusted the window in the last problem, so to go back to normal, I hit zoom six. If I want to precisely find that point, I mean, looking at that, it looks like six, but I can hit second trace, option four, maximum, left bound, I move the cursor to the left of the point I'm trying to find, right bound, I move it to the right of the point I'm trying to find, enter. Again, it's the Y coordinate for maximum 6.25. We did not need to do that for this particular question because obviously it's not more than nine and a half, which is in the lead right now. But if for whatever reason you do want to be more precise, then there you go. Choice three is the last one I need to check. If it's more than nine and a half, then it is the winner. If not, then the table will be the winner. Negative 5x squared minus 12x plus 4. Zoom 6. Is that more than 9.5? Well, yes, since it's off the screen, it is. But I'm Mr. Schlansky. I want to be more precise, so I'm going to adjust my Y max. I'm going to go second trace, maximum. Enter, right bound, enter, enter. The Y coordinate is 11.2. Choice three is the largest. 
it's not going to always ask for the largest. It could ask for, it could ask for, it could ask for a maximum. It could ask for a minimum. It could ask for a Y intercept. It could ask for an X intercept. Regardless of what it asks for, find that for each of the functions, and then tell me which one is the biggest or the smallest or whatever it's asking. Number fourteen. Now we're coming up to the point of the course where it's a lot of just little rules. You need to know what this symbol means. This is the symbol for inverse. And you need to know to find the inverse, we switch x and y. So I'm going to start by writing it as y equals, and to find the inverse, I switch x and y. Now i got to do some algebra. Hopefully you have some algebra skills. Isolate, to get rid of the squared, I take the square root of both sides. I get the square root of x minus 2. And since it's asking for h inverse of x, I'm going to rewrite it as h inverse of x equals radical x minus 2. Mr. Schlansky, is it wrong if I leave it as y equals? Well, I like to call that a gray area. And I like to stay out of the gray area. If it asks for h inverse of x, write it as h inverse of x. Determine graphically whether the following functions are even, odd, or neither. This is another one where I want to change my song because my song is too complicated because my song incorporates algebraically as well. It is very unlikely you're going to have to do this algebraically. Once ever on the regions, it's said to do it algebraically. And if you did it graphically, you got one point out of two instead of two points out of two. You need to know that even is symmetric to the y-axis. Even functions are symmetric to the y. Odd are symmetric to the origin which means if I turn it upside down, I'm gonna see the exact same thing back, and if it's neither of those things, then it's neither. 15, is it even, odd, or neither? Well, it is symmetric to the y-axis. If I flip it over the y-axis, it will land on itself, so it is even because it's symmetric to the y-axis. The second one, is it symmetric to the y-axis? No. Is it symmetric to the origin? Well, the easiest way to see that is to turn it upside down. So, if I take it and I turn it upside down, do I see the exact same thing? Yes, therefore it is odd. That's what symmetric to the origin looks like. So this one is odd because it's symmetric to the origin. And again, all of these lessons, I have full videos in more detail. You want to see how to do it algebraically, I have a video for that. The last one is not symmetric to the y-axis. If I turn it upside down, it's not going to be the same thing. It's neither. If they give you an equation, just pop it into the calculator and look at it. If they want to know if uh, y equals the absolute value of x minus 2 is even, odd, or neither, then just go to your calculator, go to y equals, type in alpha window 1, absolute value of x minus 2, Look at the graph. Is that symmetric to the y-axis? Yes, it's an even function because it's symmetric to the y-axis. You need to know your translation rules. I don't feel like writing it out. I guess I can type it out. Um, even though this thing's always so giant. I don't need this 36 font. It's got time for that. 24 font. It's still 36. Should I try one more time? 24. Whew. f of x plus a, f of x minus a, f of x plus a, f of x minus a. If I am adding or subtracting to the whole thing, if the plus or minus is literally at the end of the function, not attached or connected or grouped in with anything, then it's going the y direction, which is up and down. If I'm adding to the whole thing, it's going up that many units. If I'm subtracting from the whole thing, it's going down that many units. 
if the plus or minus is grouped in with just the X. It could be with parentheses, it could be an absolute value bars. It doesn't have to be in parentheses or bars though. If it's an exponential function, it might be in the exponent with the X. If you're adding or subtracting to just the X, that's left, right. And just like synthetic division and determining if it's a factor and factors and zeros, it's always the opposite direction when you're in parentheses. Plus to the X is left and minus is right. This is the thing to just look over right before your exam, unless of course you know you're a good student and you actually know your rules and you're able to remember them, but a lot of students have trouble remembering them. Look this over like the morning of the exam, make sure you know them and go from there. They really don't ask the algebra two regions much about reflections and dilations and vertical stretches and shrinks and God no horizontal uh, stretches and shrinks. Um, this is really all they ask as far as a commonly asked question is the translation rules. So this plus is grouped in with just the X. So that's going left A. That minus is not grouped in with just the X. That minus B comes after the whole thing. So that's going down B. So which of these is left A and down B? Choice four. It's an easy question to get right if you know your rules. Which function ha below has a greater average rate of change? Average rate of change. I think this is time for our first song. This is an easy question. You're definitely going to see average rate of change. It might be a table. Might be. Probably will be an equation. An ugly looking equation. Could be a graph. Average rate of change. Yeah, I feel like I'm changing. A lot of the stuff earlier on, I'm like changing. Where's my average rate of change? Enjoy. Friends. Would no. Walk up to me and just be like, what the f is in your mug? I don't and care about your mug. There. That's enough of that. You get the idea. And again, all my songs are on my YouTube channel, Math Chlansky. Average rate of change. Average rate of f of b minus f of a over b minus a. I try and be all emo when I do this song. Um, it has to tell you what you're finding the average rate of change between. Here it says from negative 2 to 4. So I'm going to circle negative 2. I'm going to circle or f of b and f of a are y values. I like to always go bottom minus top over bottom minus top. So it's 80 minus 1.25 over 4 minus negative 2. Let the calculator do the work for you. Alpha y equals enter 80 minus 1.25 over 4 minus negative 2, 13.125. Now, there's another function. There's an equation. If they give you an equation, no matter how ugly looking it is, this one's really not that ugly looking, they tend to give you some really nasty looking stuff. Who cares? It's average rate of change, it's easy. We type it into y equals four x to the power of three minus five x squared plus three. I go to my table of values and I'm going to write down my negative 2 and my 4. Again, it has to tell you what you're finding the average rate of change between. Negative 2 is negative 49. 4 is 179. Bottom minus top. Bottom minus top. F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Make sure if there's a negative, you put the minus negative. Again, for those of you who can't do any math, any arithmetic, it's all good. Don't need arithmetic to get an 80 or higher on the regions. We got this calculator to do the work for us. 179 minus negative 49 over 4 minus negative 2, 38. Which one has the higher average rate of change? Well, if you don't know if 38 or 13.125 is bigger, that's not good. 
g of x has a greater average rate of change. And by the way, if it ever asks for uh, the context for average rate of change, kind of have a script on average from A to B, the Y subject increases or decreases the average rate of change, Y unit per X unit. So if we're talking about like breaking distance from five, 50 to 70 miles per hour, that was that one question. On average from 50 miles per hour to 70 miles per hour, the breaking distance increases by whatever it was, uh, 7.5 maybe feet per mile per hour. So I'm just putting that out there. I wouldn't say that's a super commonly asked thing, but it, it has come up. So, you know, might as well take 15 seconds of my time to address it. You can watch my actual average rate of change video, in which case you will get a more detailed lesson on that. Two methods for three by three systems, matrix method and elimination method. It would be foolish to do elimination, elimination method for multiple choice. It takes like 10 minutes. Um, if it's open response, then we'll, we'll tough it out and I will do that later on. But for now, if it's multiple choice, oh, I got a song for this one. Let's do it. It's a short one. How to kill all mosquitoes? I don't in care the about the mosquitoes. Seconds. This simple but brilliant trick you can do tonight. XYZ equals A inverse B. So, all in the calculator. Matrix method, matrix. Some schools do RF in the calculator. I do A inverse B. You do whatever it is you got to do. Second matrix, let me start again. Second matrix, matrix is the X inverse button. It's three below the second button. Tab over to edit. Enter on A. A is always a three by three. Enter the coefficients of the matrix. The first row is one, five, negative one, four, negative five, four, etc. If you are a Cold Spring Harbor student watching this, again, you guys do your RF. You can stick to your RF. You can do it this way, whatever works for you. Don't want to confuse you. Just know whatever method you know and get the question right and move on with your life double check it to make sure it's right. It's very easy to type something in incorrectly. That one looks good. I now go second matrix. I tab back to edit. I go to B. B is always a three by one. Negative 20, 19, two. To get out of here, second quit. X, Y, Z equals A inverse B. I hit enter on A. Inverse is that same button I keep on pressing, but without hitting the second. And to type in B the same way I typed in A, second matrix B. That's X, Y, Z. So X, Y, Z equals negative 2, negative 3, 3. That means that X is negative 2, Y is negative 3, Z is 3. Which value is not contained? Well, negative 2 is, negative 3 is, 3 is, 2 isn't. If this is open response, again, ideally you're going to be able to do elimination method, which will come later in this video, because apparently I have three hours to record a video or wherever long this is going to take. But if that's not happening for you, if you just write the answers, that's one point. If you write the answers with x, y, z equals a inverse b, that's two points because now you're solving it in a method other than algebraically. But if it's multiple choice, just use your matrix method and get it right and move on with your life. 19. I see variables in the problem. I see variables in the answers. I'm going to use multiple choice strategy again. 
You need to know how to type in your roots. We'll get to that in just a moment. 16x squared times x to the power. I don't know what happened. Let's try that again. 16x squared. Oh my god. 16x squared. There we go times x to the power of alpha y equals enter, two-thirds plus the typing cubed root, math option four, and math option five is any root, eight x to the power of five. Looks good. I got 278 dot dot dot. Now I'm going to go through each choice. When I'm typing these roots in, you're going to probably have some trouble if you don't put the root in parentheses. So you always want to put the root in parentheses if it's not a regular radical. I did a little freezy freezy there, but I'm good. Sometimes this thing freezes because it's like, can you like stop doing math for a little bit? And I say, no, I'm going to keep on going. Option one, six, parentheses, math, cubed root of x to the power of five, 278, dot, dot, dot. That's it. I should go through all the choices. I'm not. I don't want to model bad behaviors, but um, I'm just, just not going to happen. Now, to do this open response, I'm going to actually do some math for you here. And I have a song for you, and the song is really important because structure is so, so, so important for these types of questions. The song gives you the structure that you need. Drinking water before bed burns 46 pounds in two weeks. I'm sure it does. If you are struggling to lose weight and you're hoping... Radicals are fractional exponents. Get rid of parentheses. Negative exponents are fractions. Clean it up and deep. Radicals are fractional exponents. Whenever you see a radical, you want to rewrite it as a fractional exponent. So for the top, I'm going to take what's inside the radical, I'm going to pop it in parentheses, and I'm going to rewrite it as a fractional exponent. The fractional exponent is always the power over the root. So it's 1 over 3. On the bottom, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take what's inside the radical, pop it into the parentheses, 1 over 4. Get rid of parentheses. If you have an exponent outside parentheses, everything inside gets it. When I'm raising a power to a power, I multiply the powers. 2 times 1 is 2 over 3 is 2 over 3. 5 times 1 is 5 over 3 is 5 over 3. On the bottom, 3 times 1 fourth is 3 fourths. And 4 times 1 fourth, 4 times 1 is 4 over 4 is 1. Negative exponents are fractions. I don't see negative exponents. Clean it up, MD. MD stands for multiply or divide. Do I see multiplication? No. Do I see division? Yes. When I divide, I subtract the exponents. So, I have fractions. Well, most of us do not like subtracting exponents, so let the calculator do it for you. For the x's, I have 2 over 3 minus 3 over 4. I get negative 1 12th, so that one becomes x to the power of negative 1 12th. For the y's, 5 thirds minus 1. 1. you saying, Mr. Schlansky, come on, I know how to subtract fractions. Well, good for you. My students don't. So we're just going to make sure we get the points. There it is. 
radicals are fractional exponents. That's step one. Then get rid of parentheses. Negative exponents are fractions. Clean it up. This is a lesson a lot of students need help with when I'm doing my readings review tutoring for even for the strongest students. This is something that I know I need to go over. So I suggest that you go and find my lesson on this and um, go from there. I do chop it into four pieces, but then I put it all together for one called fractional exponents regents practice. You will see this on the regents sometimes twice. Um, if it's multiple choice, use your multiple choice strategy. It's usually harder when it's multiple choice, but multiple choice strategy makes it really easy. Open response is usually a little bit more straightforward, but um, you need to know your procedure. You need to know what exponential growth looks like. You need to know what logarithmic growth looks like. Exponential growth has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero passes through 0, 1. That's exponential. For example, 2 to the power of x. Logarithmic growth has a vertical asymptote, passes through 1, 0, and looks like that, like a lowercase r. Asymptote means it's getting closer and closer, but never touching. You need to know what they look like. Can you type it into the calculator? Yes, but they may ask it in a way where you really need to understand what it looks like which statement is false, the asymptote. So it's asking about a log graph. So we're asking about this one. Let's just erase that. There's a thing called erasers. That will probably make that easier. The asymptote has an equation y equals zero. No, the asymptote is x equals zero. That's false. The graph has no y-intercept. Yes, it's getting closer and closer, but never touching. The domain is positive real numbers. Yes. <laughs> The domain is from zero to infinity. That's positive real numbers. The range is all real numbers. Yes, it's got an arrow pointing up and down. Choice one is false. On the grid below, graph, graphing, graphing. How do you, I hope you don't mess your graphing question up. This is, you. it could be a two point question. I mean, it could be incorporated to a four point question and it's usually incorporated into a six point question. They want you to graph something, go to the calculator, go to y equals, Type it in. X to the power of three minus six X squared plus nine X plus six. Go to the table of values. It's telling you it wants it from negative one to four. So that means that my table is gonna start at negative one and end in four. You only have to plot the nice points between negative one and four. I think for this particular question, they're all nice. They are. So negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, negative 10, 6, 10, 8, 6, 10. Negative 1, negative 10, 0, 6, 1, 8. 10, 2, 8, 3, 6, 4, 10. If you want to know what it looks like, then look at the graph. Zoom 6. It's a polynomial function. It's one of those curvy, bumpy things. Because there's a domain, there's an interval, no arrows. I'm going to have a little trouble on this little screen drawing this, but I'm going to do the best I can. I think I did great. And that's two points in the readings. Nothing more to say about that. The table shows three different investment options in which Lauren can invest 3200 bucks. Compounding, percents, you need to know your exponential modeling formulas. Oh, I have a song for this. A long one. Where is it? Here it is. Meet your next pillow. Do not. Why do we make our pillow in the shape of I do of not cube? sponsor this pillow. I'll tell you. Pounding curve, perfect 
continue with converting rays, rays, one over air. F life rays, D over H, irregular. Converting rays, rays, one over M. F life rays, D over H, regular. No. Get out of here. No. All right. So, whew, here we go. A equals principal parentheses 1 plus or minus the rate to the power of time. Divide the rate by 100. Yo, principal parentheses 1 plus minus R over N to the power NT. Compounding per. For continuous converting rates raise one over n half-life raise t over h irregular so what I mean by irregular time if something increases by five percent every three years not every year but every three years or 4.5 days it's just like half-life but it's not always half it's whatever the percent is that's what I call a regular time so if you see compounding we use the n formula unless it says continuously in which case we use pert if it's asking for half-life we use the half-life formula if it's a regular time increasing by five percent every 3.7 minutes then we use this one if we don't see either of those things we don't see compounding we don't see continuously it's not irregular it's not half-life that's when we use our basic exponential growth and decay formula and for all of these we need to divide the rate by a hundred yo so for number 23 here I always do this question, I get frustrated, I don't have enough room to do it. Because I see compounding, I'm using my N formula, unless I see continuously, in which case I'm using PERT. Option A, I'm going to use my N formula, because I see compounded. Now, because it says annually, you can use the regular one, since N is 1, but whatever. For all of these, P is going to be 3200. For all of these, t is going to be 4. For this particular one, n is going to be 1. And the r is going to be 0 0.049. And again, to get that, I can just take the rate, 4.9, and divide it by 100. Yo, 0 0.049. So it's a equals 3200. 1 plus 0 0.049 over 1 to the 1 times 4. Pop that whole thing into the calculator. 3200. 1 plus 0 0.049 over 1 to the power 1, 4. 387482 with money unless it specifically says otherwise we always want to round to the nearest cent which is the nearest hundredth option B because it says continuously pert PE to the power RT R is going to be 0 0.0481 the other variables are going to be the same so A equals 3,200, E to the 0.0481, T again is 4. E is E. E is not a variable. It's in the calculator. It's in two different spots. It's second uh, division, and it's also second LN. I'll go second LN because that one gets the exponent to pop up. 387890. Option C, compounded weekly, 
So now n is going to be 52. n is the number of times compounded per year. Uh, annually 1, quarterly 4, monthly 12, weekly 52, daily 365. And again, because it says compounded and it does not say continuously, I use my n formula. Principal parentheses 1. I know I say the song 1 plus minus. It just kind of flows, and I've left it. It's pretty much always plus with the compound because it's always interest. So again, principal parentheses 1 plus minus r over n to the power nt. And don't forget, it's com it's that's for compounding, and it's pert for continuous. So a equals 3200, 1 plus 0 0.0485 over 52 to the 52 times 4. Sorry if it's a little bit sloppy. If you got a problem with it, then, well, more your problem than my problem because it's not changing. Alpha y equals enter, 0 0.0485 over 52 to the power of 52 times 4, 3884.76. They should all be relatively close to each other. If they're not, that means you probably made a mistake somewhere. Which of these numbers is the biggest? That one. Which option should she choose? Oh, am I frozen again? No, I'm not frozen. I don't know what's going on. I'm kind of frozen. If she lost the most money, then she's going to go for option C. Moving on. I might be frozen. Yeah, I'm frozen. That's okay. Unfrozen. This question is on every region. Students don't do great with it because I think, I guess it's the reading, it's the understanding of what it's asking. A study of the annual population of the red-winged blackbird in Fort Mill, South Carolina shows the population B of T can be represented by the function B of T equals, where T represents the number of years since the study began. Began. Begin. Began. In the terms of the monthly growth rate, it wants me to convert the rate. Converting rates raise one over N. You take the rate, you take the annual rate, you take the 1.16, step one, and you raise it to the one over n power. In this case, since it's monthly, n is 12. You pop that into the calculator, 1.16 to the power of alpha y equals enter, one over 12, I get 1.012 dot dot dot, So, my monthly rate is the 1.012. Now, the tricky part is the exponent. This is the monthly rate. How many times per month do we get the monthly rate? How many times per year do we get the monthly rate? Well, if I give you a dollar a month, I give you a dollar 12 times per year. I give you a dollar 12 times per month. I get the monthly rate 12 times per year, one time per month. So the question is, what does the variable represent? The variable represents years. Since the variable represents years, I get the monthly rate 12 times per year. If the variable represented months, then there would just be a T up there. The answer is choice three. This is a complicated lesson. If you want more of this, I suggest you watch the full video on this. Step one, when you're converting rates from yearly to monthly or whatever the, the, the time frame it's asking for is, raise what's in the parentheses to the one over n power. Then you have to look very carefully to what the variable represents. If it's years, then the n goes in front of the variable in the exponent. If it's months or if it matches, then it doesn't and it's just the variable. So I think I have one more example here. Yeah, 25 last year, the total revenue for Homestyle, a national restaurant chain, increased 5.25%. So 5.25 divided by 100 or converting it to a decimal is 0 0.0525. It's increasing by a percent, so it's one plus that. 
so I have 1.0525. That's my annual rate. It wants the monthly. So, converting rates raise 1 over n. 1.0525 to the power of alpha y equals enter 1 over 12 I get 1.00427 that's where these 1.00427s are coming from now I have to ask myself what does the variable represent months now this is different than the last problem now the variable is months this is the monthly rate. How many times per month do I get the monthly rate? Just once. That's your answer. One of the medical uses of iodine I-131, a radioactive isotope of iodine, is to enhance x-ray images. Fantastic. The half-life. Boom. Half-life raised T over H. This is your half-life formula. A equals P equals T equals H equals. It says the half-life is 8.02. That's H. A patient is injected with 20 milligrams. That's the initial amount. Determine to the nearest milligram how much will remain after 12 days. So let's talk about the difference between A and P and T and H. A is the after amount. The amount after time has passed. P is your principal or initial or starting amount. T is the time that's actually passing. In this case, 12 days is what's actually passing. Why did I put 12 there? Sorry, I was thinking about something else. T is 12. T, uh, T is the time that's actually passing. And H is the half-life, uh, which it'll literally say the half-life. A is the after amount. It's asking how much will remain after time has passed. That's your A. A equals 20, one half to the power of 12 over 8.02. 20 parentheses alpha y equals enter, one half to the power of alpha y equals enter, 12 over 8.02 to the nearest milligram, 7. You might be saying, well, Mr. Schlansky, when do I do logs? Oh, don't worry. It's coming. Sequences. So, the explicit formulas are given to you on your reference sheet. One of the very few things that are. Arithmetic is... I'm going to write A for arithmetic. A n equals A1 plus n minus 1 z. And geometric is A n equals A1 r to the n minus 1. These are given to you on the reference sheet. So find the pattern. If you can find it mentally, great. If you can't find it mentally, subtract, 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 divide, divide, divide. So I'm going to subtract the second term minus the first term the third term minus the second term, the later term minus the previous term. Do they subtract to the same thing? Yes, therefore it's arithmetic, therefore the common difference is negative three. A n equals A one plus N minus one Z. A n equals, A one is the first term, 19, N minus one stays N minus one, D is negative three. I always want you to put the D in parentheses because if it's negative, it's not minus 3, it's times negative 3. Now that's fine, but you might see it in standard form where we'd have to distribute and combine like terms. Either one of the things I circled or underlined is fine. For the second one, Subtract, subtract, subtract. 8 minus 2. 32 minus 8. Do they subtract to the same thing? 120 minus 32? No. So now I try divide, divide, divide. 8 divided by 2. 32 divided by 8. 128 divided by 32. Yes, they divide to the same thing. Therefore, it's geometric. And the common ratio is 4. 
a n equals a one r to the n minus one. A one is two, the common ratio is four to the n minus one. There's nothing to combine, you're done. Those are the explicit formulas. Now, the recursive formulas. If you know how to write a recursive formula, it's easy. If you don't, that sucks. This is what your dishwasher looks like after one year. It is not. It's a colony of billions of mold and bacteria. It is not. Recursive A1 equals AN equals AN minus 1. No matter what, if you want to write a recursive formula, you start by writing A1 equals AN equals AN minus 1. From here, it's just filling in the pieces. In number 1, A1 is 19. In number 2, AN is A1 is 2. In the first one, what am I doing to the previous term? What's the pattern? Well, I'm subtracting three, so I just write minus three. In the second one, what's the pattern? What am I doing to the previous term? I'm multiplying by four. And when you're multiplying, you generally write the number in front. That's how you write a recursive formula. Now, I think that's it. If it asks you to find a specific term, which I guess it doesn't here, let's say I wanted to find the 10th term for each, it is much, much, much easier to use the explicit. So if I want the, let's just say, I do want the tenth term for each. I just replace the n with the term I'm finding. I pop each of them into the calculator. So I got negative 8. And for this one, and for geometric, it should be it should get big because it is exponential and it gets really big really fast. 5, 2, 4, 2, 8, 8. You need to know how to evaluate a recursive sequence. This is a big thing in Algebra 1. It wasn't really asked in Algebra 2. Until it was. It's been coming up a lot more recently. Recently meaning today's date, June 15th, 2022. Um, so let's make sure we're prepared for it. We start with the term after the one we're finding. We can only find one, word, one term at a time. Since it's giving me A1, the only thing I can find right now is A2. AN minus 1 means the previous term. So if I'm finding the second term, it's the first term, and the first term is negative 3. I'm substituting the previous term into that an minus 1 spot. From there, again, I'm going to assume that you can't do any arithmetic at all. No problem. 13. Now that I have the second term, I can find the third term. 4 minus 3 times the previous term. Well, if I'm finding the third term, the previous term is the second term, which is 13. You can pop this whole thing into the calculator. 4 minus 3 times 13 is negative 35. And now that I have the third term, I can find the fourth term. 4 minus 3 times negative 35. and I got 109. So it asks for the first four terms. Well, the first term is negative three, the second term is 13, the third is negative 35, and the fourth is 109. So if you know how to evaluate a recursive formula, you're good. Number 29, this is more of a modeling problem. It's really what we just did, except it's a little bit harder. It's giving me a sequence. Is it arithmetic or geometric? Well, I don't know. 
So I'm going to subtract, 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 divide, divide, divide. Stay. Good. It's always the later term minus the previous term. 25937 minus 250000. 0, 0, 0, 0. 937. 251878 minus 250937. Do they subtract to the same thing? No. Let's just be sure. 252822 minus. 251878. No, they are not subtracting to the same thing. So they must divide to the same thing. 250937 divided by 250000. Now the annoying thing is they're not going to divide to the exact same thing, but I mean, it's pretty freaking close. 1.00375 that rounds to. They both round to 1.00375. 252822 divided by 251878. 1.00375. Count it. It's, it's geometric. 1.00375. How can this sequence be recursively modeled? It wants a recursive formula. Choice one is not recursive. Choice two is not recursive. Choices three and four are. Which of these is saying I'm taking the previous amount and multiplying by 1.00375? Choice three does. You need to see this as a percent. When I'm multiplying by something, you really want to look at it as a percent. I am multiplying the previous term by 0.75. So the question is, is it getting bigger or smaller? Well, if it's more than one, it's getting bigger. If it's less than one, it's getting smaller. So this one is getting smaller. The question is by how much? What am I taking away? If I'm maintaining 75%, what am I taking away? I am decreasing by 25%. Again, if you want more help with this concept, watch my video for modeling sequences um, because this is, this is something that comes up quite a bit. So whichever scenario is decreasing by 25% is gonna be your answer, choice four. Choice one, increasing by 75 cents each week. Well, that means you're taking the previous amount and you're adding 0.75 to it. Reducing the price by 25 cents that means you're taking the previous price and you're subtracting 0.25 from it. Decaying at a rate of 75%, well that means it's decreasing by 75%, which means it's one minus 0.75, which is 0 0.25, 0 0.25 times, this is getting a little sloppy, 0.25 times the previous amount. Choice four is the answer. Alexa earns $33,000 in her first year teaching and earns a 4% increase. I can't tell you how many times I've done this question or similar questions with my students. You need to know what to do when you see 4% increase. First off, you need to make that into a decimal by dividing by 100. If you are increasing or decreasing by a percent, you are adding or subtracting that from one. So if you're increasing by 4%, it's one plus 0 0.04, which is 1.04. Write a geometric series formula, SN, for Alexa's total earnings over N years. End of sentence, end of question. Do not read on. It's asking for a formula, SN, after N years, which means your answer should have an SN and an N in it. This is also given to you on your reference sheet. SN equals A1 minus A1 R to the power of N over 1 minus R. A1, well, that's your 33,000. minus 33,000, R is 1.04, N again is N. Do not read on past that period. We are not there yet. One minus 1.04, that's two points. Now it says use this formula to find Alexa's total earnings for her first 15 years. So that's N. 
The key word for these problems is total. If it asks for the total earnings, that's where you're using SN. So now I'm not going to erase that N. I'm going to replace it in the next step with 15. So I'm going to do S of 15 equals 33,000 minus 33,000, 1.04 to the power of 15 over 1 minus 1.04. I've done this problem so many times. It's like 660, 778.39. I'm a little special, I guess. Do way too much math. 33,000 minus 33,000, 1.04 to the power of 15 over 1 minus 1.04. 660, 778.39, what did I say? With money, you always want to round to the nearest cent unless it specifically tells you otherwise. There you go. <sighs> Mortgage questions. There's always the same few little twists for the mortgage questions. The principal is always the total cost minus the down payment. The original cost is 21,000, the down payment's 1,000. 21,000 minus 1,000 is 20,000. The amount of the loan is the total cost minus the down payment. They need to tell you both of those things. If it's asking for the mortgage payment, which it is here, it says determine the monthly payment. That's gonna be your X. Five-year car loan. There's, this is another twist that will come up in every mortgage question. N is the number of monthly pay periods. So you have to take the number of years and multiply it by 12. That will come up in every mortgage question. The interest rate, just like any percent, you have to divide it by 100 or move the decimal two places to the left. The math itself is really simple. There's, we're just substituting in, and the algebra is pretty non-existent. P is 20,000, or PN is 20,000, PMT is X, 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.00625 to the power of negative 60 over 0 0.00625. This might look hard, but I consider this one of the easier questions in the course because the algebra is so simple. Now I can't type the entire thing into the calculator, but I can type this whole piece into the calculator. So I'm gonna do alpha y equals enter, one minus one plus point zero zero six two five to the power of negative 60 over point zero zero six two five. I get 49.9 dot, dot, dot. You do not want to round until the very end. So I'm gonna write 49.9 dot, dot, dot. Now I would just divide away the 49.9 dot, dot, dot. There's a mortgage question where with a student, he ran it too soon and he costed this guy like $24,000. Pretty good reason why you don't want to round too soon. 20,000 divided by, I can copy and paste that. It said to the nearest cent, 476. Now, the second question is separate from the first question. So I'm going to relist my variables. I'm gonna write P or PN, N, PMT, I, you don't have to memorize this formula, and they often give different versions of this formula. So it's not going to always be PN, N, PMT, I. It could be R, it could be M, it, it could be whatever letters they want it to be. But generally, the four variables are going to be the principal, the amount borrowed, the monthly pay periods, the monthly payment, and the interest rate. Now, it's still the same mortgage. So N is still 60, and I is still 0 .00625. It says that the monthly payment is 300. What you need to know 
if they ask you for a down payment, if they ask you for a down payment, you have to know to find P. So I'm going to now take those values. I'm going to substitute them in. So P is what I'm finding equals 300. I can kind of pull the rest here. 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.00625 0 to the negative 60 over 0 0.00625. I can type this whole thing into the calculator since P is by itself. 300 parentheses alpha y equals enter. 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.00625 to the power of negative 60 over 0 0.00625 149715 dot 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 now that's P that's the principal value of the loan to find the down payment I now subtract it from the total cost so if the total cost is 21000 my down payment is my total cost minus my principal. So my down payment is 21000 so Was I a decimal point off somewhere? Hold on, that didn't look right. 300. I am human. I do make mistakes. Something didn't look right there, so I checked my work and I found my mistake. 300 not 3,000, so it's 14,971. 14,971, dot, dot, dot. So it's 21,000 minus 14,971. So I do 21,000 minus copy and paste. It said to round this one to the nearest dollar, so that would be 6,028. questions aren't that hard again it's the same three twists always well three or four twists the principal is the total cost minus the down payment the number of monthly pay periods is the number of years times 12 the percent you have to divide by 100 to make into a decimal if it asks for the down payment you have to know to find P and that's it Sketch the following angle on the grid provided. Sketching radian angles, we're moving into trig now. It's been asked every region, but it's asked, I don't know, I feel like I could maybe take this one off, but it comes up a few times. So first of all, I want to convert this to degrees by multiplying by 180 over pi. The pi's cancel. The pi's aren't always going to cancel. You could have a radian degree measure that doesn't have a pi, you'll end up with a decimal. I have two times 180 over three. Alpha y equals enter, 2 times 180 over 3 is 120. Now that it's degrees, it's a lot easier. 0, 90, 180, 270, 360. 120 is between 90, 180 and quadrant 2. There's your angle. If I asked for the reference angle, the reference angle is the acute angle form of the x-axis. 180 minus 120 would be 60. I'm not asking for that there, uh, but that's what you would do. Trig ratios through a point. So Katoa. Start by plotting the point negative 2, 3. I need from there to make a triangle. I connect it to the origin and the x-axis. If that's negative 2, comma 3, that means that this distance is 2 and the y distance is 3. To find the hypotenuse, if it's not a Pythagorean triple, I do Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The hypotenuse is always c. So in this case, it's what I'm finding, but it will not always be the case. And I get radical 13. From here, Sokotoa, 
H is the hypotenuse, the long slanted side, opposite the right angle. The angle always connects my H to my A. That's my O. Cosine is A over H. Sine is O over H. Tangent is O over A. A over H is 2 over rad 13. Uh, sine is O over H. That's going to be 3. My computer just froze again. 3 over rad 13. Tangent is O over A. 3 over 2. Now some of you are saying, well, don't I have to rationalize those? There's never been a circumstance where you've needed to rationalize anything, so I'm going to go with, I'm not going to do it, but you do what you got to do. Now, to find the reciprocal functions, you literally just do the reciprocals of each of them. The reciprocal of cosine is secant. So I just flip it. The reciprocal of sine is cosecant. The reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. To help remember that, the S goes with the C, the C goes with the S. It's always the opposite first letter. The S and S don't go together, the S and the C go together, and the C and the S go together as far as reciprocal pairs go. And tan and cotan are a pair, they both have tan. Now this is great and all, but four of these are wrong. All students take calculus. In quadrant two, which is where my triangle is, only sine is positive. So sine and its reciprocal are positive, but everything else is negative. There's different ways these trig ratios can start. If they talk about a circle centered at the origin with a certain radius, then that radius is the hypotenuse. The radius is the hypotenuse if it gives it that. If it gives you sine of theta equals two over three, then you would just fill in the Sokotoa, two over three, and go from there. So again, you can watch this full lesson. Uh, I call this trig ratios through a point, I believe. Um, but I think we talked about enough for now. Amp sign, freak act shift. Ooh, I got a song for this. Just when I needed a break. Graphing trigonometric functions. Amsan freak at shell. 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 That's enough Amsan freak at shift. Amsan freak x shift. To write the equation of a sinusoidal or trig function, amp sine freak x shift. You need to know what your four waves look like. You need to know positive sine, negative sine, positive cosine, negative cosine. They all have five points. Positive sine goes midline max, midline min, midline. Negative sine is midline min, midline max, midline. Positive cosine is max, mid, min, midline, max. Negative cos is min, mid, max, mid, min. You need to know what these look like. There's a lot of little components to these. Um, you know what? Actually, I want to go out of order. I want to do this one first. So, amp, sine, freak, x shift. Amp is what's in front. In this case my amp is 3. Sine. Sine or cosine positive or negative. This one's a positive sine. Freak is what's between the sine and the x. The freak is 1 fourth. And my shift, also known as the midline, is what comes at the end. That's 2. The other piece of information I need is my period period is 2 pi over the frequency, period is 2 pi over 1 fourth. If you can't divide by a fraction, well, maybe you should learn. Multiply by the reciprocal, keep change flip, my period is 8 pi. So, four dashes, one, two, from your y-axis, four dashes, the period goes to the end of the fourth dash, 
the midline is 2. The amplitude is how high and low I'm going from the midline. So from the midline, I'm counting up 1, 2, 3, and down 1, 2, 3. And now it's a positive sign. So again, I know that positive sign goes midline max, midline, min, midline. So I go midline, max, midline, min, midline. If you know all the little components and you practice it, it's really not bad. But there are a lot of little components to learn. Now the other direction, if they give you a graph, there's an easy way and a not as easy way. Let's do it the not as easy way first. To find the midline, it's the min plus the max over 2. The min is 4. It looks like each box is worth 2 here. The max is 14. So it's 4 plus 14 over 2. That's 18 over 2, which is 9. Sketch it in. So. Again, to start, midline is the min plus the max over 2. The other piece of information you need is the frequency. The frequency is 2 pi over the period. The period is where the first full wave ends. Where does the first full wave end? Well, if you, you need to know your waves, but it ends there at 12. So frequency is 2 pi over 12 which reduces to pi over 6. Now that I have that, amp sound, freak at shift, amp. Amp is the distance from the midline to the max or min from 9 to 14. From 9 to 4, my amp is 5. Is it sine or cosine, positive or negative? Well, it's starting at my midline and going up, so it's positive sine. The freak I already found to be uh, pi over 6. And the shift I already found to be 9. So it's y equals amp sine freak x shift. Which of those is equivalent? It's got a t and a d instead of a y and an x. Choice 4. If it's open response, that's what you got to do. If it's not open response, here's the easy way. Still got to know that it's amp sound, freak X shift. Well, let's look at the components. Let's look at the shift. Let's eyeball it here. The midline, is the midline at 5 or 9? 5 is here, 9 is here. Which of those is the midline? Not 5. 9 is. So those are out. And then from there, is it a positive cosine or is it a positive sine? Well, it starts at the midline, it goes up. It's a positive sine, it's not a cosine. The answer is choice 4. So if it's a multiple choice, you can kind of use your knowledge of a couple of the components to eliminate choices to get to the correct answer. I didn't need to find the frequency at all in this particular problem. What's next? Ooh, probability. Whew. Keep on rolling. Or, ooh, I got a song for this.
A lot of formulas you need to know. I guess I should write them out here, right? P of A or B equals P of A plus P of B minus P of A and B. P of A and B equals P of A plus P of B minus P of A or B. P of A and B equals P of A times P of B, yeah. P of A equals P of A slash B for independency. Not doing the high note right now. This is your go-to. This is the one that comes up in multiple lessons. If they're asking for or, or and, or and, but it says independent, those are your formulas. The or and the and are the same. They're each each other, but subtracting the other from it. This one does not come up much. I mean, you can use it if you're given a two-way table, but the top one is a lot easier to use. But there may be a question where you might have to use this bottom one. We're not going over in this video because it is not a commonly asked regions question, but it has come up. So you have to know these formulas. The song helps you, of course. It wants or, it's a very key word, it wants or. P of A or B equals P of A plus P of B minus P of A and B. Probability of A is 0.27, so that's P of A. Event B is 0.36, that's P of B. Both is another way of saying and, that's P of A and B. B. So P of A or B equals 0.27 plus 0.36 minus 0.11. You can just pop that into the calculator. 0.27 plus 0.36 minus 0.11 is 0.52. And that's it. Leave it as a decimal. Don't convert it to anything unless it specifically asks you to. Done. Or and and are very key words in probability. And, does it say anything about independent? No. So I use the first and formula. P of A and B equals P of A plus P of B minus P of A or B. That's P of B. Or is 20%, so that's P of A or B. Now, in general, in this course with percents, you want to make them into decimals, so I'm going to make them into decimals. You don't have to for this particular problem. If you're using the independence formula, you do. In general, just take your percents and make them into decimals. P of A and B equals 0.14 plus 0.18 minus 0.20. Excuse me. 0.14 plus 0.18 minus 0.20. 0.12. Done. It's just popping into the formula. On a given school day, the probability that Nick oversleeps is 48%, and the probability of the pop quiz is 25%. Okay. Assume these two events are independent. It's telling you they're independent, and it's asking for and. P of A and B equals P of A times P of B. Yeah. Because it's asking for and, and it says they're independent. That's the formula you have to use. You can't use the other and formula because there's no or. It didn't tell you or. So P of A and B equals P of A. Let's let that be oversleeps. Again, make it into a decimal, 0.48. Let's make pop quiz B, 0 0.25, 0.48 times 0.25 is 0.12 again. 
and you can leave your answer as a decimal. You don't have to make it back into a percent. It wouldn't be wrong, but you don't have to. I feel like I'm starting to write a little sloppy. I should probably take a break soon, but I won't. Two A tables. I got a few questions, a couple questions here. I can give you some keywords, but I can't give you a keyword for everything. Your first step in a two A table is to total everything up. Total up all the rows. You can use a calculator for this, of course, if you need to. Total up the columns. And very important, total total. You can either total up the rows or the columns. It's uh, 200. So keywords and and will always be over the total total. So if you see if you see two things that it's talking about and the word and between them, your denominator will always be your total total. Also, if it's asking for one thing, your denominator will be your total total as well. Out of those 200 people, how many are over 60 and against the candidate? 35. There's no formulas to use for this. If they give you a two-way table, you just pull your fraction from the two-way table. What percent of the 21 through 40 age group is for the candidate? Am I choosing from everybody or am I choosing from a certain group? I'm choosing from a certain group. There's no key words here. A key word for conditional probability is given that. If I say the phrase given that, the condition, the group you're choosing from always comes after the phrase given that. And you can watch this video on two-way tables for more details. I don't see that here, but it says, what percent of the 21 through 40 age group? It's only asking about the 21 through 40 age group. So I circle the condition out of the 50 people, how many are for? 30. Because this one asks for a percent, you would now need to make it into a percent by dividing and then multiplying by 100 which would be 60%. So, I mean, of course, they can ask you more things with two-way tables. If you're choosing from a certain group, circle that condition, and you can only use values inside there. If you see a keyword of and, it's going to be over the total total. If it just asked you for, let's just say the probability of someone was for the candidate, your denominator is your total total, and your numerator would be how many are four, the total four, which would be 75. There's a lot of different questions they could ask, um, but and is always over the total total, one thing's always over the total total, and if you see the phrase given that, the condition comes after the phrase given that. Number 42, the results of a poll of 200 students are shown in the table below. Again, whenever I see a two-way table, I wanna total everything up. So that's going to be 90, 65, 45. I'm going to use my calculator. Oh, I think I have an answer key here. I can probably just look at that, right? Oh, wow. I still have a lot left to do. But we did a lot. That's a plus. Uh, 106, 94, total, total is 200. It wants to determine if they're independent. You need to know the formula for independent. Same form we used before. P of A and B equals P of A times P of B, yeah. Decide what you want A and B to be. It doesn't matter, but one has to be a gender and one has to be a preferred music style. So I'm gonna go for female and techno because that just sounds fun. So in this formula, there are no conditions. So my denominator for all three is going to be my total total. Out of those 200, how many are A and B? Female and techno? 54. P of A, how many are female? 106. P of B, how many are techno? 90. Are these equal? Well, let's type the left-hand side into the calculator. It reduces to 27 over 100. Let's type the right-hand side into the calculator. 
106 over 200 times 90 over 200 477 over 2000 are they equal no so tell me that they're not equal this formula shows independence since it's not equal they are not independent every region just like everything we're going over pretty much every region seems to ask a question on that okay the heights of women in the United States are normally oops I'm frozen okay let's try that again the heights of women in the United States are normally distributed this might be one of the easiest questions if you know how to do it whenever you see normally distributed that's when you do normal CDF so normal CDF lower upper mu sigma the mean is 64 that's your mu your sigma is 2.75 what per what is the percent of women whose height are less than 60 when you see less than the upper is that value and your lower is zero you go to your calculator and we do second vars option two lower is zero upper is 60 mu is 64 sigma is 2.75 I get a decimal, 0 0.07 dot dot dot. From there, there are three different ways it could end. If it asks you for a percent, we multiply by 100. If they ask you for a quantity, we multiply by the total quantity, and it would have to tell you that within the problem, to the nearest percent, 7%. Now there's a second question. So I'm going to write my values again. Lower, upper, mu, sigma. My mu and sigma are not changing. But now it wants taller than 69, which makes 69 my lower. And my upper is essentially infinity. I can't type infinity in, so I type in 9 and 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, or whatever your favorite number is as many times as you can put it. I know different schools do this slightly differently, but it's the same concept. So I go back to normal CDF, second VARS, option two. My lower is 69, my upper is nine, 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 nine. Mu is still 64 and sigma is still 2.75. I get my decimal 0 0.03, dot, dot, dot. Now again, there are three ways it could end. If it asks me for a percent, I multiply by 100. If it asks me for a quantity, how many, which it does here, I multiply by the total quantity. And if it just asks for a probability, I'm done, I leave the decimal. It's asking me for a quantity, how many, so I multiply by the total quantity, which it has to give me, in this case, 250. So I take that decimal, I multiply it by 250, I get rounded to the nearest woman, nine. Moving on. A doctor wants to test the effectiveness of some new drug, so before we do this question, let's talk about the types of statistical studies. A survey is when you're asking somebody something. On paper, verbally, a Google form, a survey is when you're asking somebody something. A controlled experiment is when you're applying a treatment. You are randomly selecting a sample, you're randomly assigning half to a treatment group and half to a control group. From there, you are applying a treatment to the treatment group. You're actually affecting one of the groups, you're giving them a pill, you're giving them, you're dropping a candy into a bottle, you're actually affecting one of the groups. An observational study, you're not. You're just observing data that already exists. 
a doctor wants to test the effectiveness, of, the effectiveness of a new drug on her patients. She separates her sample of patients into two groups. She separated them. She administered the drug. That is a controlled experiment. The only way to create a cause and effect relationship is through a controlled experiment. They could all suggest patterns and relationships in data. And by the way, what a census is, a census is a survey where every member of the population is involved. That is not very practical, so it is more common to do a sample survey. Which brings us to number 45. If I do want to do a sample survey, I want my sample to represent the entire population. I want to avoid bias. If I want to know how uh, Westbury High School students feel about soccer, it would be biased to ask the soccer team. They're all going to say yes. It would be biased to ask the drama club. They're all Most of them are going to probably say no because drama students aren't as into sports as most students. I want it to be random. Every 10th person walking into the building in the morning would be a random sample. I might get some soccer players. I might get some uh, drama kids. I'm going to get a little bit of everybody because the school has a little bit of everybody. That's the point. So, a survey is being conducted about Americans' favorite musicians. Which of the following survey methods would most likely produce a random sample? So it wants a good sample. Asking every 20th person at a Green Day concert, that's bias. People that go to Green Day concerts like a specific type of music. They like alternative rock music. That would not represent everybody in the country. Not everybody in the country goes to Green Day concerts. Asking every 10th person at a vintage record store, that's bias. They like these old, old 70s, 60s, 50s music. That does not represent everybody. Not everybody goes to the record to the vintage record store. Asking every tenth person at the Westbury Public Library. Well, you're talking. You're asking one community. One community does not represent the entire country. That one is biased. That might give you a good picture of how people at Westbury feel about music, but not the entire country. Not Americans. Sending out surveys to random households across the country. Every member of the population has a chance of being chosen. It's random. There's no bias. That would be your answer. Anne has a coin. She does not know if it is a fair coin. She flipped a coin 100 times and obtained 73 heads and 27 tails. So she got 73 out of 100 or 0.73 proportion of heads. She wants to know if her coin is fair. To determine if a coin is fair, I need to find my confidence interval. My confidence interval is the mean plus and minus two times the standard deviation. So it's telling you the mean and standard deviation right there. 0.497 plus two times 0 0.050. 0.497 minus 2 times 0 0.050, 0 0.597, 0 0.397. So my confidence interval is 0.397 to 0.597. The confidence interval is the range of expected values. It's the middle 95% of the data. An object is fair if the output is inside the confidence interval of a fair object. So, I got 0.73, a, or I shouldn't say I did, I didn't have time to flip a coin 73 times, I mean, come on, I'm making a three hour math video here, or maybe more, but Anne had time, she got 0.73, is 0.73 an expected value of a fair coin? No, therefore, her coin is not fair. Ah, uh, yes, here we go, the very commonly asked, simple four point question. There's a lot of reading, but even if you don't want to read it, we know we need to find the comments interval and see if something's going to be inside. I guess I can read it. A radio station claims to its advertisers that the mean number of minutes commuters listen to their station is 30. The station conducted a survey of 500 of their listeners who commute. The sample statistics are shown below. Nothing important yet. A simulation was run 1,000 times based upon the results of the survey. The results of the simulation appear below. Nothing important. Based on the simulation results, is the claim that commuters listen to the station on average 30 minutes plausible? Well, to determine if something is plausible or expected or usual, I have to find the confidence interval. The confidence interval is the mean plus and minus two times the standard deviation. It's right there. So it's 
29.101 plus 2 times 0.934, 29.101 minus 2 times 0.934. I've done this question enough times, but I don't want to chance it. I don't want to chance it. I don't want to mess it up. I've got 27.233. I've got 30.969. Often you'll have to round the confidence interval. Not always, but often does it tell me to, later on in the question, explain your response using an interval containing the middle 95% of the data. That's the confidence interval it's talking about to the nearest hundredth. So yes, it asked me to round. It's always a smaller number, comma, the larger number. So, is 30 minutes plausible? Well, is 30 inside or outside the common center interval? Since it's inside, it's in between these two values, yes, because 30 is inside the confidence interval. So, Determine the, to determine if something is plausible or possible or expected, find the confidence interval, round appropriately if asked, and then you're going to either say yes, the value is inside the confidence interval, or no, the value is not inside the confidence interval. Which brings us to the mean differences problem. So we said before, to perform a controlled experiment, I need to randomly select a sample, randomly assign half to a treatment group, half to a control group. Apply the treatment to the treatment group, give a placebo to the control group if possible, analyze the data. Here's how we analyze the data. Step one in analyzing the data, calculate the mean difference, which is going to be subtracting the average of the treatment group and the average of the control group. And it says that, scented minus unscented. 23 minus 18 is 5. This particular question doesn't say to explain in the context of the problem, but I'm going to do that anyway. What that means in the context of the problem is, on average, students who took the test on scented paper scored five points higher than students who took the test on unscented paper. Let's move that somewhere so you can actually see it. That's the meaning of it in the context of the problem. The question is, yeah, my computer's done with me. The question is, is that a significant difference? There's going to always be a difference due to random chance. If I take a class and I randomly take half of them and I put the other half on the other side and I find their average grade, it's never going to be exactly the same. Just due to random chance, it's going to be different. So is this five I got something that I would get due to random chance or did the scented paper make it that way? Well, to answer that, I need to re-randomize all the tests, create a sample distribution, and then I need to find if my mean difference is inside or outside of the common interval, or happens more or less than 5% of the time. So here's the deal. If it's less than 5%, yes, it's significant. Because I shouldn't have gotten that value due to random chance. If it's more than 5%, no, it's not significant because I would have gotten that value just due to random chance so that the treatment did not affect the outcome significantly. So we look at five and more extreme. There are three dots out of a thousand. The magic number is 5%. Make it into a percent, three divided by a thousand times a hundred. 0.3%. Is that more than 5 or less than 5? It's less than 5. So is the difference in means statistically significant? Yes, because 
five or more extreme occurred less than 5% of the time. Now, usually this is how you have to do this question. In this particular problem, they gave you the mean and standard deviation, and they actually asked you to find the comments interval, which kind of made this problem a little bit easier. So I can now do the mean plus and minus two times the standard deviation. Point zero three plus two times one point five four eight and minus and it's said to round to the nearest hundredth so I've got negative three point zero seven and I've got three point one three so you could have also said yes because Five is not inside the confidence interval. For these questions, they usually don't give you the mean and standard deviation, so you usually have to do it as a percent, but in this case, you had two options. So, to determine if a treatment is effective, if, uh, uh, if a treatment, if, if something is statistically significant, Find the mean difference, the difference in the means of the two groups, re-randomize everything. If that value or more extreme occurs less than 5% of the time, then yes, it's statistically significant. It shouldn't have happened due to random chance. The treatment made it that way. If it occurs more than 5% of the time, then no, it's not statistically significant because they would have gotten that value due to random chance. And if they give you information for the comments interval, if it's inside the comments interval of random values, then no, it's not significant. If it's outside the confidence interval for random values, then yes, it is significant because I shouldn't have gotten that big of a difference. The reason I did was the scented paper. Boom. Gene. Gene invested $380 in stocks. Over the next five years, the value of her investment grew as shown in the accompanying table. Write the exponential regression equation. Well, there you go. Exponential regression equation is exp reg. Stat edit. Clear whatever's in there. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. 380, 395, 411, 427, 445, 462. Stat, calc, option zero is x -breg. Your frequency list needs to be blank. It should be blank. It should default to blank. Um, because there's no frequency list here. If you're doing statistic stuff, mean, median, mode, you might have had something there. So y equals a times b to the power of x is your standard form. You need to be very careful with your reading and rounding. This first question says to two decimal places. So I have 379.92. For B, I have 1.04. Make sure you put to the power of X. Do not read past it. The first question asks for an equation. You need a Y equals and you need an X. Now that I have that, I move on to the follow question. Using this equation, find the value of her stock to the nearest dollar 10 years after her purchase. So be careful. Determine if that's X or Y. If it's X, sub it in for X. If it's Y, sub it in for Y. 10 years, years is X, so I'm going to replace the X with 10. 379.92 
1.04 to the power of x, whoops, to the power of 10. I'm distracted. There's other people in here. People got no respect for math. So be very careful. It says to the nearest dollar. The first question said to two decimal places. The second question says to the nearest dollar, which is zero decimal places, which is 562. So read and round very carefully. The different parts of the question will tell you to round to different values, so be very careful. And if it did give you y instead of x, you'd have to use y1, y2 intersect to solve the equation, or you'd have to do the algebra, which is coming up soon. A major car company analyzes its revenue, R of X, and costs C of X in millions of dollars over a 15-year period. The company represents its revenue, blah, 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 profit. Profit is revenue minus cost. So P of X profit is revenue or R of X minus, I don't know how I'm going to fit this. I don't know how I'm going to fit this. I'm going to have to get a little uh, unorganized here. Now, to subtract polynomials, we keep change change, or we distribute the negative. So it's going to become, I'm going to try and write little here, 550x cubed minus 12,000 x squared plus 83,000 x plus 7,000 minus 80 x cubed plus 21,000 x squared. Again, I'm distributing the negative minus 150,000 x plus 160,000. From there, I just combine like terms. Use the calculator if you need to. I got P of X equals negative 330 X cubed plus 9,000 X squared minus 67,000 X plus 167,000. Profit if they ask you for profit, profit is revenue minus cost. We're getting closer to the algebra. I call these complex formulas. They'll give you a random formula. They'll give you a bunch of weird variables. They'll tell you what they are, and then you'll have to substitute them in, and the math itself usually is not that difficult. After sitting out of the refrigerator for a while, a turkey at room temperature is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, let's see. What's room temperature. Uh, let's read through the whole problem. Is placed into an oven at 8 a.m. when the oven temperature is 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Newton's law of cooling heating explains that the temperature of the turkey will increase proportionally to the difference between the temperature of the turkey and the temperature of the oven as given by the formula below. That whole sentence is confusing. Don't worry about it. If the value of K is 0 0.066, determine the Fahrenheit temperature of the turkey to the nearest degree at 3 p.m. So, after sitting out of the refrigerator for a while, a turkey at room temperature, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, is placed into the oven. So, the turkey is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the initial temperature of the turkey. It's placed into an oven at 8 a.m. Cool. When the oven temperature is 325 degrees. So, that's the temperature surrounding the turkey. That's TA. It says that K is 0 0.066. Determine the Fahrenheit temperature of the turkey. So it's asking for the temperature of the turkey at 3 p.m. Well, it was placed in at 8 a.m., so 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. is 7 hours, so little t is 7. Now that I have all that, I'm going to carefully substitute it in. T equals TA is 325 
plus T0 is 68 minus TA is 325 E to the negative 0 0.066 times 7. This question might have looked hard. It might still look hard, but it doesn't to me because T is by itself. I don't have to do any algebra. I am going to just type in 325 plus parentheses 68 minus 325 parentheses E second LN to the power. Oh, I already got a power. Negative 0 0.066 times 7. Does that make sense? Is the t a temperature, a, a turkey temperature of 163 sound about right? Yes, if it said like 500 degrees or like negative seven degrees, that would probably be a problem. It said to round to the nearest degree, that would be 163 degrees. Again, I call these complex formulas. It's kind of like the mortgage problems where they're giving you this giant formula, but there's no twist to this one. You just have to read carefully about what value is which variable, substitute it in and pop it into the calculator from there. Factoring. All right, now we get into the real algebra. Should I make a separate video for this? I think I should. I think I should end it and make a separate video for the algebra. And that's what I'm going to do. Bye.